I've loved the flow this morning of all that's gone on, and I'm aware some of you may find it disorientating because, you know, we, we, we started by breaking the program and praying for church planning and for this church, and in that context, there was a prophetic word delivered in a somewhat ecstatic way, and some of you will be thinking, great, this is the real stuff, and some of you will have been thinking, what's going on there? Then uh, we segued neatly into talking about a vital issue, which is single-use plastics. Some of you will have been thinking, at last, we're talking about something meaningful. And others will have been thinking, what the heck's that got to do with everything? And then we watched a video, long video, about someone in the liberation stream with a passion for social transformation, social justice, needling us with awkward political questions. And then he gets hijacked into the Toronto blessing, man. And healings and all that stuff and falling over. And so some of you basically like the first half of the video and some like the second. There's more applause in the second, but the social justice guys just don't clap as much. So, And then we went into a terrific time of worship together and, 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 and you know, full-on charismatic hands in the air. And, you know, what are we to make of this? Here's what I make of it. I, I believe that it's time for the different streams in the body of Christ to come together, and I just want it all. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our speaker, who is a leader in one of the most remarkable wings of the Pentecostal tradition. And um, if you want to get your head around this, I'd encourage you to read a book by Richard Foster called Streams of Living Water, which I consider seminal, because it traces the evangelical and charismatic the liberation, the sacramental, and so on, the different great traditions of the faith that are all 2,000 years old and explains why we need one another. And so I'm just sick and tired of having to choose like one dish from the menu. I kind of want to choose it all. And so I know there's some discomfort in that, but I want to ask you to push into the discomfort because I believe that only in Christ do these things hold together? And uh, I don't want a, um, a cartoon character, Jesus. I want the real thing, and it's complex. And so that's what we're all about in 24-7. And we use a slogan, prayer, mission, and justice. That's just a slogan to try and encapsulate the fact we believe different types of spirituality fit together. So that's that. Um, our speaker this morning is uh, just one of the most remarkable people I know. Uh, he is a pastor of Jesus House Church in, in London. Uh, he's really an apostolic leader in that, uh, you know, he, he started the church with 30 people in uh, 25 years ago. And that church with those 30 people has now grown, grown to 3,000 people and has planted 832 churches. Um, they regularly would gather 40,000 people to pray through the night at the Excel Center in London. Uh, Pastor Agu was um, an investment banker and a barrister before 26 years ago, ago he stepped into pastoral ministry. And he's really a, a statesman in the faith in the UK and beyond. I think I first connected with him through uh, one of my dearest friends and mentors, Jeremy Jennings, who's our former chairman, who's just sitting there. And, um, you know, he, this year I would say that Pastor Agu, I don't think he knows this, has probably had more impact on my life personally than almost anyone else. I'm not saying this to butter him up. I'd kind of rather say it without him listening, to be honest. But, you know, in, in April we shared a platform together at an event called Spring Harvest. And i worked hard and prepared some talks, and then someone else told me, Agu would never have told me this himself, but he had been fasting for 21 days um, in order to preach at this event, and I was deeply personally challenged. 
And then uh, he preached this phenomenal message. And Brian Heasley and Phil Togler and I sat there and just thought, we've got to see if we can persuade him to come to the 24-7 gathering and deliver this message. Because, boy, this guy knows everything about prayer. Uh, and then uh, that was April. Then in May, we, we, you know, 24-7 has helped to start this new festival in the UK called Wildfires. And um, we had the incredible honor of receiving Pastor Agu's kind of boss, uh, the, 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 the general overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Pastor Enoch Adeboye. Uh, and he, he came to our little festival. I think, you know, we had a few thousand people at the festival. It's probably smaller than his coffee rota. You know, we were so honored that he came and and he drove across this beautiful estate on which we were gathering in, in nice Mercedes, you know, towards the big old tent. And we had these big letters up that said wildfires, it's obviously the name of the festival, and some idiot had changed the letter so it said mild fires. And like, this is, and I, you just, you just can't get the staff, can you? Like, I found out it was one of our senior leaders had done it. And, Literally, literally, no one could be bothered to change it. So, and, and Pastor Enoch um, prayed for all of the key leaders there, laid hands on them. We believe in impartation. You know, not just information downloaded to brains, but impartation heart to heart and often through the hands. And uh, he prayed for every leader there. Uh, and then... Uh, through, through them, every leader then prayed for everyone else. And I, I, I believe there was a very powerful moment of impartation there uh, that has, has lit a new fire in hundreds of churches, uh, particularly throughout the UK. And so that, that, was, that was May. And Pastor Enoch just spoke with such authority and dignity. Here's a man whose uh, church prayer meeting is a million people uh, just outside Lagos. And whose church sanctuary, well, building is two miles by two miles square. Uh, and, and, you know, they've planted the redeemed Christian church. God have planted into over 150 countries around the world since they were founded in 1952. So at what point, do those of us here who are sort of white and Western, at what point do we get over ourselves and realize maybe we don't know what we're doing? We need to humble ourselves and just learn. And I had, you know, I, I, I just think when people are mobilizing hundreds of thousands to pray and are planting churches that rate, I don't know about you, I just want to get on my knees and say, teach me what you've learned, lay hands on me in part, because I, I feel like I don't know nothing. And here we are, this prayer movement going 20 years, and, and uh, let's not think we're anything, we're just nothing, we're just this very small little uh, group of people who've got caught up in this great wave of what God and then um, last week, uh, some of us were with uh, Pastor Agu in, in Peterborough, England. We had some of the leaders of the largest churches in the UK, and he spoke so powerfully to us uh, there. And so I, I've asked uh, him to share, but I just want to ask him a couple of questions first, because uh, I'm just really anxious to get as much out of him as possible. And then I think we can only fit about 60 people in the room where he's doing the Q&A later, so I just suggest you get there in good time, because... It's the law of the jungle in the kingdom, right? It's just, you know, first come, first serve. So um, uh, I'd love us to, uh, um, you know, G Jesus says, do you have ears to hear? Uh, that means Jesus can walk through your town. If you haven't got ears to hear, you'll miss what Jesus says. And, and, and I, I just believe sometimes it's important to receive people as one sent by God. And uh, part of that is about um, honoring those who spend their lives humbling themselves. That's the way of the kingdom. And I also believe it's a way that we open our own hearts and open our own ears to receive by faith. So the pressure isn't just on them to speak well, but us to listen well. So for a lot of reasons, I, I would appreciate it if you'd like to do so. If we could just stand and welcome Pastor, in, uh, Pastor Agu to the stage. Okay. 
so, uh, Pastor Aku, thanks for coming to Belfast. I know you only had three hours sleep last night, uh, so it's very, very kind of you to come. And I, ju I, I just want to ask you a couple of questions before, before you share, if that's okay. Um, the first one is this. Why on earth did you fast for 21 days before speaking at Spring Harvest? Um, can I just say two things before I answer that question? First thing, first thing I want to say is I, I really want to thank you all for this opportunity. I want to thank you all for this opportunity. It, it's actually a very humbling one for me um, because... Uh, there's a phrase in the Bible I love, iron sharpens iron. And I'm here and I'm thinking, these guys think I have something to say to them. And um, by the time Bob finished, I thought, I really don't have much to say to them. <laughs> and so if you notice, I, I, I sat down during a lot of the worship and I was just saying, Holy Spirit, you really have. If not, there's going to be a lot of disappointed people here. And after, after that introduction that Pete gave, I thought, it's getting worse. <laughs> so, uh, if anything happens, you would have seen a modern day miracle. The Holy Spirit would have moved. Um, I, I really do find it very, 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 very humble. And, and want to thank you for... Um, why did I fast for 21 days? Um, because I, I've, I've come to, rea first, I, I guess I should say this, I don't really like fasting. Um, oh, good. I, 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 think I guess one of the reasons Mike and I got, got on and are going to really get on is because he loves his food and I love my food. Um, so I, I fast because... I have come to understand that uh, it's a critical part of the prayer process. Uh, that abstinence to uh, give yourself completely to God, uh, to open up yourself for whatever God wants to do. Um, I've seen it do amazing things. Um, if I just, uh, the Redeemed Christian Church of God was a regular church. Um, other churches in Nigeria. And I think it's significant that the explosion that we talk about now came after a 100-day fast. Um, and so the whole church was called to a 100-day fast by the general overseer. And immediately after that fast, the church exploded. It's, it's now, we're told, the fastest growing church in the world. Um, and it came right after that. And I can give you testimony after testimony, story after story. Uh, of things that have happened when uh, a people or a person, you know, abstains from, from food and sets their whole mind to seek God, um, it, 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 you know, God will move. And I, I think when Jesus says, when you fast, he expects us to fast. He's not saying if you fast, he's saying when you fast, uh, which means it's part of our, yeah. So that's, but, and I knew I was coming to spring harvest. I, I felt... There were, there were three or four things in the year that uh, the Lord had laid on our hearts uh, would have a significant impact uh, on, on, on our faith in the nation. One of them is 24-7 uh, in Belfast. The, uh, the other one was Spring Harvest, and there are two others. And so I got our team together, and they've been praying into it for the whole year. Um, and I knew I had to prepare myself if God was going to use me. So I just decided I would just fast into it um, and, and see what, what God does. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for your prayers. And um, I was very struck. I think it might have been talking with Yemi, actually, rather than you, but um, about your church planting strategy. We just heard that you, you, there are 832, I think, now in, in the UK. But the, the role that prayer plays in the way that you plant churches, can you just talk to us a bit about that? Okay, just to say the 832 churches didn't come out of Jesus' house. It came out of the network of churches. And one of our pastors, our pastor in Belfast is here, uh, Chris. So just appreciate him, Chris. Um, yeah, go on. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we 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 believe that uh, advancing the kingdom of God is spiritual warfare. Uh, if not, it would be so easy to do it, wouldn't it? Um, and the amount of opposition to it in various forms uh, just informs even the uninformed that it is spiritual warfare and that you're not just going to go into a place and take over the place um, and, and, and the enemy is not just going to um, pack up his bags and run off and release all the souls to the kingdom. We believe that there, there will be a contention for the space, a contention for the souls uh, we believe there will be a resistance to the advance of the kingdom of God because it's all about setting people free um, into the freedom of the kingdom. And so when we plant churches, uh, we believe that there's a lot of uh, uh, spiritual warfare, a lot of praying that goes into the establishment of the church and taking territory for God. And so uh, a lot of prayer will go into the planting of church we'll, we'll get a team on the ground they'll be praying for hours um, every single day sometimes for months um, they'll walk the streets in prayer um, they'll, they'll, they'll visit the library you'll be amazed as to how much information is in the local library about a place that helps you de deal with whatever you're dealing with in that area um, they'll, they'll link up with other churches because we believe it's a kingdom work um, yeah, and, and there'll just be a lot of praying. I remember before Jesus' house started, on average for three months, on average, uh, we were praying seven, eight hours a day on average. On a bad day, six hours. Um, but on, not, on a normal day, seven, eight hours, and sometimes more. Uh, we, 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 just, we, just, we just lived in a house and just prayed nonstop for three months. We'd wake up, pray, sleep, wake up, pray, sleep. Um, as we kind of establish the church. So prayer, prayer is significant, we feel, um, to establish in a church. Amazing. Uh, just, anyone feeling challenged right now? Okay. Final question, and then, and then we'll let you loose. It, um, I suspect you'll be sort of too self-effacing and humble to talk about this, which is why I, I want to make you do it in the form of an interview. But I've been personally challenged just by your personal prayer life, because every now and then I've had hints and whispers of what that uh, looks like. But just, just headlines, but just give us a sense of the time that you put you and your wife personally into prayer. Uh. Okay, um, let me start with the encouraging part. Uh, it, 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 it can be sporadic. There are brilliant days, and there are some days that are not so brilliant. So it's not, I'm not supercharged 24-7, 24-7, um, all year round. There are some days that are... Uh, yeah, there are some days I just lie in bed and it's like, God, I'm tired and I'm not going to get out of this bed. I'm going to try and talk to you in this bed and I fall asleep. Yeah, so there are, do, there are, there are those days. Um, my wife is a great encouragement in prayer. My wife is a very, shall I say, a very disciplined woman. Um, and she actually prays a lot more than I do, believe it or not. Um, in a consistent way. I, I, I think I do uh, a lot more in bouts, but she's very steady and consistent in her prayer life. Um, talking about myself is challenging, but okay, we, on a normal day, normal day for us, um, we'll, we'll spend at least two hours in prayer um, every morning on a normal day. Uh, most, some days it's three hours in prayer. But every other day it will be at least two hours in prayer in the morning uh, before we start our day. And then there will be, uh, now there will be prayer meetings in the evening or, or you know, stuff that I'm doing. If I'm meeting with the management team, we will pray before we start. Uh, 
Um, and then we have uh, concentrated bursts of prayer where we dedicate quite a number of hours in the day. Um, we just came out of one, uh, we called it a, a week of birthing prayers. And basically we just felt it was, we just needed to travel a bit, a bit more to birth God's plans and purposes for the church uh, and the nation. Um, and that would be in addition to those two hours in the morning. We, I would do 10 to 12 with a team. Um, and then I would do 7 to 9 uh, in the evening with another team. And then we'd do 12 to 1, uh, 12 midnight to 1 a.m. with another team. But we did that for a week. And we tend to have that uh, a few times uh, in the year. Yeah, so that's sort of... It's amazing. Everyone wants strategies and models and philosophies of ministry. But the secret sauce really is that... that heart of prayer. So, uh, Aki, thank you for being here. We, we lift all pressure off you. Thank you. <laughs> but we look to the Lord. We're already, who yeah. here is like, I've actually been encouraged and challenged enough already. So, so yeah. it, it, just say anything you want and uh, we're just yeah. grateful to have you here. Yeah. Aki. Thank you. Thank you. Um, like I said, I've been incredibly challenged already myself by what I have heard and what I have seen. Um, to, to know that there are 29 different nations represented here, um, to see this number of people um, gather uh, all around prayer, incredibly challenging and incredibly exciting and inspiring for me. Um, we hear all the, all the bad news about the church in decline, the church becoming irrelevant, uh, church buildings are being sold off with, you know, for coming temples and mosques and pubs and flats and restaurants. Um, but you come and see something like this and it just sends a, a clear message to you that the church is very alive, very vibrant, very dynamic, and the kingdom of God is marching on. Um, and I just want to commend, and I, I just, I was saying to, I think I was saying to Pete that, uh, Mike, I'm not sure which one, uh, or, 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 who I was speaking to, but I was saying that uh, when you're in something, uh, don't fully appreciate significance of it. It often takes someone who comes from outside and sees what is going on and says, wow, this is something amazing. And I want you to know that you're involved in something that is amazing. At the start of, when, when I got the invitation, it was one of the things the Lord said, myself and my team and the team that pray should pray into. And God said to us, it's significant. I didn't fully understand that. I, 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 God said it, so I knew it was. But I'm standing here and I'm beginning to get an idea of how significant what is going on with you guys is. Um, and so I just wanted to encourage you uh, to just keep at it. Um, I sense that we're close to, to the dam bursting, closer than we think. And I just wanted to encourage you to just keep at it. Um, I'm privileged to be here. I really am. Um, I'm going to send all kinds of messages to my wife to say you, you really should have been here. <laughs> Amen. For a few minutes, uh, for, well, for the time that I have, I, I, I want to talk about... Uh, something I have called uh, Lord teach us to pray. Just share a bit um, some, some, some things on my heart for where we are uh, in this nation and in the nations with regards to God's plan, God's agenda, God's purpose. Um, and 
it's in, it's funny because I got a confirmation last night that this is what I should speak about. I was at a gathering churches together uh, in England. I serve as Pentecostal president of that. And we hosted quite a number of churches, about 100 of them, um, in uh, uh, Cardinal Nichols' uh, home. Um, and it was a wonderful gathering. Um, um, Catholics, Orthodox churches, Pentecostals, the whole, the whole expression of the church. And I sat next to, and, and the way we do it, you know, we mix it up so that you end up sitting with people you don't know. And I sat next to this gentleman, and um, we got talking, and somehow we started talking about uh, uh, the Lord teaching us to pray. And as he spoke, I thought, that's, that's, that's what you, that is what God wants you to talk about. Um, and then I walk in, and uh, I join the, the, the leader's prayer meeting. And um, towards the end of the meeting, uh, Mike comes up to me and starts to speak prophetically into my life. And then he, one of the things he says is, uh, the Lord is going to teach you uh, new ways to pray. And he goes on and talks about that. And as soon as he said that, I just knew that, that I was, at least, I was hearing God. And um, at the end of it, I said to him, you can't believe you just what you did. And then he grateful that he also was hearing God. We haven't all missed it. Um, and so I just want to talk a bit about that. And of course, I'm sure you know where that comes from. Luke's Gospel, the 11th chapter. Um, um, now, it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he sees that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now, uh, just to put that in a bit of context, uh, this is the 11th chapter of Luke's gospel. There are 11 chapters that precede that. Nine of those, nine of, nine of those chapters uh, describe to us uh, Jesus' life, the miracles, the healings, the demonstration of power. His disciples are walking with him. Uh, obviously, they've prayed with him. Uh, they, they've learned to pray themselves. But... As they watched him pray, they, 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 they felt there's something that is missing in our lives. There's something that's missing in our work. We have done all these things, but there's something he has that we don't have. And it's interesting that they didn't say to him, teach us to preach, teach us to work miracles. It was teach us to pray. And I guess... It must have been a light bulb moment for them. Uh, you know, one of those where something dawns on you. Uh, and I suspect when we finally get to heaven and ask them, they will be telling us that as they watched him in prayer, they had one of those light bulb moments. That the reason that there is so much impact in his ministry, the reason that the ministry is changing lives, transforming lives, the reason that the ministry is so powerful is connected with what he's doing. And even though we are doing it, there must be some dimension to it that has brought about the results that we see. And so they couldn't wait for him to finish and go up to him and say, you've got to teach us what you do there that, results, that, that creates these results, this impact that causes the blind to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, that causes the, the widow of Nain's son to come back to life, that causes the multitudes to be healed, that, that allows you to speak with such wisdom uh, when you're confronted with those who oppose you, that allows you to have such boldness and courage, that allows you to keep going against the persecution. It, there must be a connection between what you're doing in that place of prayer and the results that, that we're seeing. And they must have been saying to him, we, we, we have prayed, but obviously there is prayer and there is prayer. And there are things that you do in that place of prayer that we need to learn so that we can get the same results that you get. 
And I guess we all would probably be in the same place. That's, that's why we've gathered together. That's why we're challenging ourselves because we're saying there is a bit more to ministry. We've done well and we thank God for how well we've done. But then if you're like me, and I know you are, you're saying, God, there surely is a bit more to this. There's a bit more of power that we seek, a bit more of a demonstration of power. There's a bit more of the working of miracles, a bit more of the healings, a bit more of the transformation, uh, a bit more of the advance of the kingdom. And we are hungry for that bit more that will make a difference. In a sense, we are saying we've been praying, Lord, but what do we need to pray and how do we need to pray to get the kind of results that you got? We're saying and we understand because we're people of prayer that there is a connection between the prayer and the results. And so we're saying, Lord, reveal to us what we need to do, how we need to pray so that we can get the results that you got. It's the kind of question I really would have wanted to ask Moses. Uh, it's the kind of question I would want to ask him after, after I see, if I, I, if I had the chance, to have seen what happened at Rephidim. Uh, how the, 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 their, their perennial enemies, the Amalek, Amalekites, came against them. And as Joshua got up young and full of energy to engage in battle, these enemies, the old man gets up and starts to climb the hill. And I guess if I was there, I would be saying to him, the battle is in the valley. That's where we should be fighting. But the old man starts climbing the hill and Aaron and her, who kind of had got used to his mystical ways, follow him up the hill, really not knowing what he's going to do. And he gets to the top of the hill and he lifts up his hands in the posture of intercession. And Aaron and Hare are watching this and they're thinking, what's going on here? And in the, in the valley, Joshua engages the enemy. He gets on with the work. He feeds the poor. He... he he, he gets on with the work of the ministry. He, 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 he pastors the church. He, he goes on missions. He does the outreaches. And they notice something. That whenever his hands are raised up, Joshua is taking territory for the kingdom. But because he's old and his hands start to come down because he's tired, they notice that Joshua is losing ground. And so this seesaw thing happens a few times and then they get a light bulb moment. They realize that, hang on a second, whatever this man is doing up here is connected with what is happening down here, down there. And so they think, well, we better help him do what he's doing, even if, even if we don't fully understand it, because when his hands are lifted up, there's victory down there. But when his hands come down, they are losing ground. And so they put, they put a stone, sit him on the stone, the old man, and one, Aaron stands on one side, her on the other, and they lift the old man's hands up. And the Bible tells us that as they hold his hands steady in the place of prayer, Joshua routes the Amalekites. I would have loved to ask Moses, I would love to ask Moses, what kind of prayer did you pray? Because if I can understand what he prayed then i can pray in a like manner and i can get similar results i would love to ask elijah what kind of prayer did you pray on mount camel my the king james version of the bible i counted it 63 words elijah I prayed all night and I haven't seen the fire yet. You prayed 63 words. What kind of prayer did you pray? I would love to ask Elijah, what kept you going when you put your face between your knees? Because you had heard the sound of the abundance of rain and you believed that it would rain, the drought would end. 
What kept you going? How come you were not deflated, defeated? How come you didn't lose hope when your servant kept coming back to you to say there is nothing on the horizon, no sign of the revival. The churches are shrinking, numbers are dwindling, they are losing their buildings, the church seems to be on the retreat and yet Elijah, you held on believing that what God told you would come to pass. Elijah, what kind of prayer did you pray? How come when he came back the sixth time, you didn't give up? How come you kept saying to him, just go back and check, and you stayed in that place of prayer? Elijah, with your face between your knees, what exactly were you saying to God? Because if I have an idea, maybe I can say a similar thing, the same thing. Maybe it can stir me up. Maybe it can give me some nuggets that I can pray when, the result, when, when I'm told over and over again, that it's not happening. What did you pray to keep you going? And eventually, the seventh time, the servant goes. And by this time, of course, I'm sure you know, the servant was going simply because he was the servant. And he, he, the, the, he, he, he didn't want to look for another job. But, but, <laughs> but, but he wasn't going because there was any hope in him that anything would happen. He was just going because he had no choice. He was the servant. And the master said, go. And I would love to ask that servant, what did you feel when you went there not believing there was anything and you looked and on the horizon, the cloud that was bringing the rain was rising up the size of a man's feast. I would love, I would love to ask Stephen, how come you were being stoned to death For doing good, for serving God, for obeying God. And when you had a chance, and we all would have said we understand, to pray the kind of prayer that in our Pentecostal circles, we love praying, deal with my enemies. How come you had that chance, Stephen? And we would have understood because they were killing you. They were stoning you to death. And yet, you knelt down and you cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when you said that, you fell asleep. How come you understood that it was a pivotal moment if you said, Lord, charge them with this sin, heaven would have charged them with that sin and it would have delayed the revival. But then you put yourself out and said, just to follow God's agenda, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. How come you prayed a prayer like that? I would love to ask Stephen. And believe me, I would love to ask Jesus. God not get him. I would really love to have a conversation with him about that. About the weight that was on him. About how he came to the brink, desiring that the cup should pass over him. About how he didn't go over. About how he said, well, it's heavy, it's onerous. I'm not even sure how I'm going to deal with it. But not my will, but your will. I would love to ask him questions about that prayer. I would love to say to all these guys and more, teach me how to pray that kind of prayer. And for you and I, I feel we are at that place where we have given so much. And that's not to say that we're boasting. But we've given it as much as we can. But we all realize that what we have given is not enough. But if you're like me, you've reached really the end. 
And you're saying, God, what else do I give? That's why I, I've come to say to us that there is a whole new level, a whole new dimension, a whole new vista in prayer. But then we have to turn to God and say, God, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray prayers that are relevant, prayers that are critical, prayers that will turn nations around. Teach us to pray prayers that are on your heart for the time and the season. And we, as people of prayer, realize the time and the season we are in. Every one of those prayers that I shared with you was critical to a nation, critical to a people. Every one of those prayers, the people who prayed had to pray precisely, exactly as God wanted. And I think we've come to that point where we're saying, God, thank, we're grateful for all the general prayers we've prayed. But the nations are at such a point that there isn't room for error. Teach us how to pray. Give us the words. Give us the timing. Help us to see into your heart so that we are really following the, your agenda. We are bringing words to you that you require to do what you have purpose to do. Lord, teach us to pray. Because the truth is that in the nations, things are hanging in the balance. It's 500 years since the, the Reformation. I'm sure like me, you sense that something is about to happen that is as significant as the Reformation. And it's going to take the prayers of the saints to, to pray God's heart back to him for what is shaping up to happen to come to pass. And as I thought about this, as I have thought about it, I've come to a place where I realize that the help we need now is the help of the Spirit of God. More than ever before, the intercessors who are standing in the gap, and incidentally, part of my encouragement in this room is that I know that God is still in the business of using one person. He finds a person who will stand in the gap. And I'm looking at a thousand plus people and I'm saying, God, this is too much for you. So I, I'm excited because one person God can do with one person. Now imagine what God can do with all of us in here. Uh, that should excite you about the future. More than ever before, as intercessors, we must get into the deepest relationship we've ever had with the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God in prayer that is going to make the difference. In, uh, in John the 14th chapter, verses 15 to 17, uh, this, Jesus speaking, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells within you. And it's that, that, that phrase, that name of the Holy Spirit that keeps coming to mind now in the place of prayer. Holy Spirit, I have reached the end of everything that I can do. I need you to help me. And if there's anything that I wanted to leave with us. It's to stir us up to that, to, to that place where we acknowledge our complete, utter helplessness. That we simply are unable to pray the kind of prayers that will cause to happen what you and I want to happen. It's almost like the disciples looking at the extent of Jesus' Comparing what they, do, what they did with what he, what he was doing. Realizing that there is no chance on this side of eternity that they can have the same impact. 
and going up to him and saying, you know what? Teach us. Tell us what to do. How do we pray? We find ourselves in the same place where we realize the enormity of what is required. This move of the spirit that is required against all the opposition that is out there. And we realize that, Lord, it simply is not going to happen the way we are going. We will get this result and that result. We'll get this testimony and that testimony. But if we are looking for a transformation, an awakening, it is simply not going to happen like this. Two hours of prayer in the morning is not going to do it, Lord. You've got to help us by your spirit. Teach us how to pray. And I guess that's what the Bible brings home in Romans, the eighth chapter, the 26th and 27th verse. Likewise, the spirit helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I actually love the passion translation of that scripture. And in a similar way the Holy Spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty. To empower us in our weakness. For example, at times we don't even know how to pray or know the best things to ask for. But the Holy Spirit rises up within us to super intercede on our behalf. Pleading to God with emotional sighs too deep for words. God the searcher of the heart knows fully our longings. Yet he also understands the desires of the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us. His holy ones in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. And personally, that's where I feel I am. Where I'm saying, God, you just have to help me. You have to help my human frailty, my weaknesses. And don't we all have them? The days you don't feel like getting up. The days you can only pray for five minutes. The days that you are in the discipline of prayer, but not the delight of prayer. The days when you're praying and you know that there isn't faith behind the prayer. Because you've just read another report that tells you that by 2050 the church would be totally relevant in your country. But then because you're an intercessor, you're holding on. There are days when we are overcome by our human frailties. Days when the stuff that you're dealing with in your own private life seems so overwhelming. There are days when you look at the fruit of your work and it just doesn't seem commensurate with the amount of work that has been put in. There are days when if we are truthful to ourselves, we are overcome by fear. There are days when we are battered by failure. And I can go on and on and on. In our weaknesses, our human frailty. But you know what encourages me? The Bible says Elijah was a man of like passions. That means Elijah had the same issues that we had. And in some cases, his issues were even worse. I mean, who would imagine that after that mass awesome demonstration of power on Mount Camel, Elijah would become suicidal? Sit on a tree and just think, you know what? I'm going to kill myself. It's just, I'm overwhelmed. I'm tired. It's a bit too much. Can I speak to someone who's here? And I feel the Lord wants to say this to some of you. Outwardly, And it seems okay. But in your heart, you are tired on the verge of giving up if you had a way out. I want to say to that person that the Lord said to tell you that this gathering is your season of refreshing and a turnaround for you.
And so our cries, Holy Spirit, help us. Help us overcome our frailties. Help us overcome our weaknesses. Help us not to be intimidated by other people's stories or successes. So, sometimes when you hear, oh, he prays for this, he prays for that, he says for that, I felt that a lot of times. Thank God for the I haven't raised anybody who's died. I've laid hands on many people and, and, and I've seen many people who have died. So it's easy to even get intimidated within the body of Christ. It's easy to look at what's happening with so and so and wonder, God, what am I doing wrong? Pray the Spirit of God will set us free from everyone that has become a burden to us. So God, help us. Holy Spirit, help us overcome our frailties. Empower us in our weakness. Teach us what to pray and how to pray. Help us to pray God's mind, God's will for every situation that we find ourselves in. I'm a firm believer that every door has a key. Every door has a key. That's why it's a door. The fact that we can't find the key doesn't mean that there isn't the key. And so what are we saying to God? We're saying, give me the key to my city. Give me the key to my community. Give me the key to my nation. Give it to me in words in the place of prayer. Give me your heart so that I can bring it back to you in the place of prayer. So that you can do what you purpose to do. And you know, if we look at the early church, we find that if there's one thing that stands out as the key to the success of the early church, it surely was their yieldedness and their faithfulness to the Holy Spirit. I've heard it said before that that book should really have been named the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because that's what it was about. And the encouragement for you and I is that we have a lot more than the early church had. A lot more resources. We have the Bible, which they, they didn't have. They had some letters that hadn't been put together, but we have the complete word of God. All we need now is a complete yieldedness and submission to the Holy Spirit. Let him become central. Let him be the agenda. Let him drive the prayer. Let him give us the words. Let him lift us up from the place from wherever we have fallen. Let him encourage us in the place of prayer. Let him become the prayer that we're praying. And then we will see the results. You know, uh, I love how Jesus announces his ministry in Luke 4 verses 18 and 19. It's encouragement for us. We're looking for the results of faith. And he the way he announces his ministry tells us the solution. John, Luke 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And then he goes on to give us the reasons for that. What am I praying for us? I'm praying that as we enter a time of impartation, there's going to be a fresh outpouring of the Spirit of God on every single one of us. And then we will be empowered to enter a whole new dimension of the church. Amen? And let me end um, by sharing this with you. And this is, a, this is what I received as I sat down there. I think there's a, a lot of symbolism in a lot of things that are happening. I, I, like, the, I like the theme, Rising Tide. I really love the, the theme, Rising Tide. The moment I heard it, I, I, I got excited about it. And I think many reasons why. Uh, the, 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 one of the symbols of our Spirit of God, of course, is the water. And, and I can see the Spirit of God rising in our lives. The tide rising in each one of our lives. And as I sat there, uh, the Lord dropped a scripture in my heart. And I want to end on this. It's, 
Ezekiel the 47th chapter. Uh, 12 verses, Ezekiel 47. And this is what I feel God wants to do to me. And the prophet says, starts by saying, In my vision, the man brought me back to, to the entrance of the temple. There I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing the right of the altar on its south, south side. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me through to the eastern entrance. There I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. I, I really am believing God that the Spirit of God will flow like that. That, that there's nobody here who has opened themselves to the Spirit of God that will not be carried along the path of the Spirit of God. He said, There I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for 1,750 feet and then led me across. The water was up to my ankles. And there will be some where the water is up to our ankles. But you're not going to stay there. You haven't come to Belfast with water up to your ankles to go back to your place of assignment with water up to your ankles. Something must happen. Amen. Uh, he measured off another 1,750 feet and led me across again. This time the water was up to my knees. The tide is rising. And, and after another 1,750 feet, it was up to my waist. The tide is rising. Then he measured another 1,750 feet and the river was too deep to walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. And... and struck me because you see when it was up to his ankles he was walking yeah we were doing it uh, of course we were leaning on god but there was a lot of us in it we we, we could walk without any aid we we helped ourselves we used some of our intellect we, we we were very involved in the process and when he got up to knee deep it, it was harder to walk but he could still walk. We could still use our ideas. We borrow one from one church, borrow seven ways to take a city from a book, borrow three ways to dethrone demons from another book, borrow seven, seven ways to create an outflow of the Spirit from the best-selling author. We listen to a pastor and we take his lifestyle and try and make it our lifestyle. All that is good. It's getting results. We are still walking, but we are walking. And then he gets to where it is waist deep. And it's more difficult to walk now. There's a lot of pressure that is coming from heaven to say, you're reaching the end of your tether. You can't do it anymore your way. You have to learn to yield to the spirit. Thank God for strategies to take a city. Seven ways to overcome the demons. Ten ways to, to win the kingdom. Fourteen ways to get souls to come. But, but how about just putting all that aside and allowing heaven to do it the way heaven wants? And finally, he gets to a point where he says, I can't go further. It's too deep. Now, God is calling us to get deep. And the deep place is an interesting place. It's a place of helplessness. You, 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 to go further, you have to allow the water to carry you. Now, I swim a lot. It's my favorite spot. I love swimming. One spot I love. And I was trying to teach my wife to swim because she doesn't swim. I mean, she's, she's learned now, but she couldn't swim. And I kept saying to her, relax. I said, because you're so frightened, you're sinking. And she never could understand it. I said, just relax. The water will carry you. And so I demonstrated it to her. I said to her, I'm going to lie on the water. And I lay on the water. What are you doing? I said, nothing. I'm just lying on the water. She said, she said to me, but when I lie on the water, I sink. I said, yes, because when you lie on the water, you're not relaxed and you're not expecting the water to carry you. You're expecting to go down, so you go down. I think God is saying to someone, relax. It's my plan. It's my agenda. It's my purpose. They are my people. It's my world. It was my son who died for it. You don't care about them more than I do. 
just relax and allow me to give you the strategy, the ideas, the way, and give you the words that you will bring back to me so that I can do what I have purpose to do. <laughs> have you been watching, son of man? Then he led me back along the river bank. When I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. Can I say to someone, as you go back, be ready to be surprised. Because there's a sense that there's, there's, a, there's a part that expectation plays in our prayers. I see people who pray but don't expect things to happen. I pray expecting things to happen. And so I'm looking forward to surprises when I leave here. Because the truth is that you might think that I came to bless you. Trust me, you have blessed me more than I have blessed you. I can't wait to tell my wife. I'm excited about what will happen in church on Sunday. I expect that there must be an overflow from this gathering. Prepare to be surprised. That's what I want to say to someone. And then he said to me, the river flows is through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of this stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. God wants to bring things back to life. He wants to bring communities back to life. He wants to bring a life here back to life. That's the whole essence of the spirit flowing. Wherever the river went, it brought things that were dead back to life. I spent nine weeks in church every Sunday talking about the river. It was because after 20... 27 or 28 years of ministry, I suddenly realized that talk about him, but really, do we talk about him? Understand how significant he is in the scheme of things. If Jesus says, it is in your interest, it is expedient for you that I go so that I can send another like I suddenly realized, hang on a second, Jesus is not here anymore. He has sent another, and the other that he sent, I have largely ignored. Of course, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher, so I acknowledge him, but how much of my life have I really yielded to him? Has he just stepped over the threshold of the door of my life? And he's still waiting at the door. Have I ushered him into an ante room and sat him down there? Have I given him freedom downstairs in the house? Or have I allowed him into every room in the house? I think the Spirit of God is saying, I can do a lot more with you if you would create the space for me. Like I said to our guys in the church, I said, you can't be preaching to people in church on Sunday who's going in. I was in a hurry. But for him, he looks for those who are waiting. Start, it was go and wait. They were waiting in an upper room. Now we are constantly walking to a program, an agenda. We only have 30 minutes and we've got to move on. But then he says, you have to wait. So I pray that we learn the grace of waiting for him. Because he comes to those who wait for him. Those who send a clear message that he is so important that we can suspend every other thing. And we're just waiting.
For a while, I, I, we would just want to wait for him to come. Let that river flow in this place. Let that river flow in this place. Let that river flow in this place. Our greatest ally in prayer is the Spirit of God. It's a win win situation. Can you look up at me for a second before we move to the next one? How, how God has used that prayer. He's God. He has all the power to do whatever he wants to do. All power belongs to him. But then, he has limited himself to a partnership. Partnership with you and I. Challenge is that he knows what he wants to do. He has his plan and his agenda. So guess what God does? This is grace and mercy at work. He says, you know what? This is the way it's going to work. Out of myself. So when I want to do what I want to do, as long as you will talk to me in you, I will tell myself using your vocal cords what I want to do. I can trust you to tell me what I want to do because you will have your own agenda. Or you will misunderstand the signs of the, and, and the time. So don't worry about it. Suspend that your fantastic intellect. And just allow me to speak to myself about my own plan for you and for the world. And as I speak to myself, I will then do what I want to do, what I am telling myself I want to do. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that is so fascinating to me. So, all I have to do is know that he's, he's there, submit to him, and allow him to do the work. I just have to turn up. And because he's not magical, God could easily be a magician, but he chose not to be. He has to use me. My vocal cords. So that's my, my only, the only thing I have to do is present myself. The utterance comes from him. The language is his. A lot of times I don't even understand what I'm saying. But he perfectly understands because he's speaking to himself about his plan and his destiny. What a picture of grace and mercy. So it's impossible for you and I to lose as long as we show up. The challenge is when we don't show up, then nothing can happen. But as long as we show up, then it's impossible for us to lose because it's his plan, it's his agenda, it's his people, it's his world. And it's him speaking to himself. Just using you. Give God a clap offering, God. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we thank you. Oh, sweet Holy Spirit, just come now, Spirit of the living God. Come, doing different things in, in, in our lives. For someone, Lord, it's just taking the weariness away, bringing a refreshing. For another, Lord, it, it's bringing a clear revelation about where they are at. For each one of us, Lord, it's empowering us, O oh God, to step into a new level, O oh God. The tide has risen, Heavenly Father. The tide has risen. For every one of us, O oh God, it's going beyond the ankle level, the, the, the knee level, the waist level. Lord, we want to swim in the deep. Swim in the deep. Just wait for the Spirit of God. Believing God that we will be.
be empowered. This is significant. 20 years of 24-7. 20 years of, of good people who have yielded themselves to the Spirit of God. But then God is saying it's a new day. It's a new dawn. It's time to enter a whole new territory. And let's just believe that as the Spirit of God comes, as, as we get out of the way for Him to flow unhindered in this place, that He will do what only Him can do. Let's place a demand on Him by our hunger, our thirst, and our desire for the Spirit of God to flow unhindered in this place. Like a river, flow, Spirit of God. We are totally dependent on you. Flow, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Spirit of the living God. Come and, and renew, revitalize, re-energize, refresh that vision. Refresh that vision, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit.